Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the Fish Nerds Podcast. And I'm Jeff Danielson, your effing librarian. Welcome to the show that's about fish, fishing, and eating fish. Yeah, wow. Hey, Jeff, welcome back. Uh, our effing librarian, that means tonight is the night we talk about John Garrick. We'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Um, and But for first, I want to talk quickly um, about Patreon and about how our show is funded. Because uh, a lot of people don't know this, Jeff, but I'm not a millionaire. Really? Yeah, I'm a dozen heir. I, I have dozens I you of dollars. you making that big ice fishing guide money. I mean, I like know. you just, you're rolling around in piles of money. I know. I know. I have dozens of dollars. That's not a lie. Um, <laughs> so I'm a dozen heir. But uh, our show needs money to keep it going. Uh, we produce an hour of entertainment every week. I spend probably... 20 to 40 hours a week producing content, monitoring Facebook and tweeters and all that stuff and talking to listeners and writing the show uh, and editing it and all that stuff. And all that stuff costs money. And we're asking our fans to help support the show. We want everyone who listens to this show to throw a dollar into the hat for every week they listen. So $4 a month. Jeff, I was doing some math on this. If everyone did this of our listeners, then I could quit my job and make a living podcasting. That would be nice. It would be nice. It would do two things. One, it would grow the show. And two, it would allow the show to, to improve in quality because some of that money would be spent on uh, better audio recording equipment. I can mail you a good recorder and you can do more field work for us. Um, so if the show makes money, the show gets better. And we need, need everyone to do it. To donate to the show, uh, and I say donate, it's not tax deductible. We are a for-profit enterprise. Someday I'm going to be an entrepreneur. But right now I am. Someday. Uh, right now I keep giving it away for free. <laughs> um, but we, we do want to make some money. If you want to give a dollar to the show, go to patreon.com slash fish nerds and help us crowdfund the show. You throw a dollar in the hat. I will mail you some decals and a thank you note. And by the way, those who have donated recently have never gotten their stuff. I did a big mailing today. And also, if you've been donating for a while and haven't heard from me in a long time, I also mailed you something today. So everyone's getting something today. Gonna get some of that sweet effing swag. Effing swag. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. And you know, and if you need something, just uh, the, the Fish Nerds. I like to think the Fish Nerds podcast uh, is the most accessible podcast on the internet. I don't know of any other podcast where if you reach out to me, I'm gonna respond to you immediately and talk to you and become your friend. Um, and that's kind of always been how we've been been around trying to build community. So this is our community. And help support it by giving a dollar to the show. And that's it. But let's move on because we can talk about how I want your money all night. But, um, Jeff, I've been trying, as you know, to learn to fly fish. Yes, I've been following your exploits on, <laughs> or lack of exploits. Well, I've been exploiting. Facebook. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I bought a new fly rod this year. I talked to fly fishers. I've been reading fly fishing books. I've been to fly shops. And I've been to rivers that have trout and salmon. And this is typically how a trip for me goes. And actually, typically, this is how it goes every time. <laughs> I find a river that I know fish live in. I cast a fly for about a half an hour. In some cases, most cases, I can see the trout. And they don't care about my fly. <laughs> Usually, I, I hook a tree. I tangle. Yes. I snag. Yes, that's all part of the fly fishing experience, yep. yes. And then I put my fly rod away. And I go grab my spinning rod with a little Cleo on it or a Musilic... Uh, shiny spoon on it my favorite one's called the wonder bread it's, it's got a wonder bread pattern of dots on it and i cast out and i on the first or second cast i catch the fish i'm hunting so last week it was atlantic salmon i saw the fish in the water couldn't catch it first cast with a spinning rod no problem second cast with a spinning rod huge rainbow trout I, I, it's an efficiency game for me right now. I'm like, this is, yeah. maybe fly fishermen just like to make it harder because fishing is actually really, really easy. <laughs> well, so, it does have a it does have a steep learning it does. curve. I will say that. Um, yeah. Go go find some bluegill mm. and and uh, go hook up on a bunch of bluegill for a while to get my get feeling get good your, about it. <laughs> yeah, get you feeling good about it. I, that's what I do all the time. I'm like bluegill. They they haven't met a fly that they won't eat. No. And so whenever I feel like I'm like, ah, <laughs> just go out and, but yeah, this, the learning curve is steep. And I'm sure, you know, when I first started fly fishing and especially with trout, you know, mm -hmm. it was a while before I caught my first trout fly fishing. It, it is, it is difficult. And I'm going to guess that 
the reason you're catching them on spinners or I mean on spoons is, is they're going for bait fish. And so mm-hmm. some sort of really flashy bait fish fly, but I don't know if it's got to have that wobble like a spoon. This is a lot of what, this is a lot of what fly fishermen and fly tires do is reverse engineer right. um, conventional tackle <laughs> into a fly. It, it's a craziness. Um, and well, and so let me cut to, so yesterday I went out and I didn't, I didn't get my fly rod out at all. I had I had less than five minutes of fishing time. I try to fish every day, so I had less than five minutes. I was driving past a river that I don't usually fish. Grabbed my spinning rod, had a Miss Cleo on, which is a little classic uh, spoon, and in one cast, the spoon hit the water, and I hooked a fish. And I'm usually really good at identifying fish, and I got this one wrong. I caught a fish that I didn't recognize, and it was a fish I knew really, really well, like really, really well. And it was this it was about seventeen inches long, this golden yellow color, silvery spots on it, you know, all this stuff. And I uh, and I and I, I called it a brown trout. And I put it on the internet and I'm like, I caught a brown trout. And everyone's like, Yeah, including you, Jeff. You're like, Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, it's an Atlantic salmon. Um but it looks so different than any salmon, late landlocked salmon I've ever seen. I've seen a lot. Right. Uh, it was a different color. The scales were smoother. It was shinier. It was prettier. Um, but even even people who fish a lot are going to get them wrong once in a while because I made a classic blunder of fish identification, and that's judging a fish by its colors and Correct. not looking at the actual traits of the fish. And that was my mistake. Uh, but it's a really pretty fish, and I suspect that fish was a um, wild fish and not a stocked fish. And that might yeah, it, account for the differences. Yeah. And there's a great deal of variability in some of these things. Absolutely. And the brown trout and the Atlantic salmon are very, very closely related, um, both in the same genus. Mm-hmm. And especially when they're small, really small, it can be really hard to tell the difference. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's the extra row of teeth in its mouth. It's the tail shape. It's the tail shape. It's the adipose skin on a brown might be yellow or gold, whereas a salmon, it would never be that color. I mean, there's all these little tricks. And the mouth of a salmon comes down like what, past its eye or something. But, the, but I don't ever need those things. Like I never get these two fish mixed up because I know them so well and I right. got it wrong. <laughs> because that I saw I saw that us. golden yellow color. I'm like, wow, and it's totally wrong. But you know, but I cut that on a spinner. And then today I went back to that same spot with a fly rod and I tied on what's called a uh, it's a red ghost. So it's a flashy red ghost, supposed to replicate smelts in this area. Right, a streamer. Yeah, cast that until I tangled. I got this giant tangly mess on my uh, on my leader, and then two casts with my spinner, and I caught a rainbow trout. <laughs> so yep. it's really yeah. hard to like get past that knowing that I can get a fish in in less than five minutes in any other style of fishing. Uh, yeah, it's tr- it's and I think frustrating. Yeah, I think that uh, it may just be that they're so keyed in on bait fish right now. Yeah, that, that that it's going to be hard to find something that replicates that. No, that it's going to be hard to. I think a good fisherman could do it. Yeah, well, they make spoon flies. They're literally epoxy. They're made out of epoxy, so they're light enough you can cast them. But they make spoon flies, so you might look into that. Oh, that seems like cheating. <laughs> Popular for redfish, I guess. I, I bet. Maybe I'll put a worm on a fly rod next time, and just to really shake it up for those fly fishermen yeah. out there. Yeah. That, you know, none other than Tom Rosenbauer will tell you that that's a great way to catch fish with worms is with a fly rod. Wait, we're totally, everything works. Fish don't care. Yep. So, but hey, we're not here even to talk about that. Um, it's it's effing book club day. It is indeed. Uh, and we read this week a, it was, it was a fly, rod, uh, fly rod of your own, or is it my own? It's fly rod of your own. It's a fly rod of your own by John Garrick. And this is cool. The publishing house contacted me. Which means it's cool. The fish nerds are on the radar of Simon and Schuster, right? That's so right. They called us, Big time. and they said they sent a book directly to you, Jeff, right? Correct, they did, and to me, and they offered a copy to a listener. So we have one copy that Simon Schuster will send directly to a listener. We just have to decide how to give it away. Any thoughts? Hmm. Hmm. I want someone who mm-hmm. listens to this show, not someone who hears about it on Facebook. Right. Yeah. We probably ought to have it be someone call in and 
tell you how to catch a fish on a fly rod. <laughs> I love it. I'll tell you what. That's a great idea. How about you call, if you want this book, um, and this, so this show is coming out on Monday the, this, Monday the 22nd, sorry, Monday the 15th. So between Monday the 15th of May and Friday the 19th of May, so just five days there, in that time period, if you call the Fish Nerds hotline, 607-378-FISH, 607-378-FISH, and you tell me one tip for catching a fly, fish on a fly, I will drop your name in a hat, and whoever wins, wins. And typically, That's we nice. only get four or five phone calls on this hotline, so odds are really good. If you want this book, very good. 607-378-FISH, and I'll also, I will mail you also some Fish Nerds decals and maybe, um, maybe a fly I hate. <laughs> or maybe I'll send you a fly I can't catch fish on, and you can catch fish on it and send me a picture. So 607-378-FISH, tell me one trick, just one, don't waste my time, one trick to, uh, uh, to how you catch a fish on a fly. And I'll put the names in the hat, and the winner will get a nice book by John Garrick. Now, the other cool thing, Jeff, is I got to call John Garrick's house and talk to him. Yeah, and I was so bummed that I have this stupid job, uh, <laughs> get stupid money so that I can live, mm -hmm. because for me, getting to talk to John Garrick would be akin to, oh, I don't know, for many people, I suppose, maybe talking to, you know, their quarterback of their favorite football team mm -hmm. or something like that. I mean, the guy's a legend. He's a big deal. In fact, he was recently inducted into the Fly Fishing Hall of Fame. Yeah, he's not just a great fisherman. He's a great writer. Mm -hmm. He's his books are consistently good. They're they're nominally about fly fishing, but that's not really what they're about. I think um, I think that they're about life, mm -hmm. and his fishing takes him places, and he meets people and does things. But really, his writing is about uh, life, the places he goes to. I think it's really accessible reading. You don't have to love fly fishing to enjoy reading his books. No. In fact, uh, here's a question. So uh, kind of is, uh, should we play the interview with him and then talk about the book or talk about the book and then play the inter interview? What do you think? Why don't you uh, play the interview? And then we can um, reference that in our conversation because he'll cover yeah. a lot of this stuff, right? Yeah. All right. So here's uh, the interview with John Garrick. And forgive the quality. When, um, when you're making a podcast in your basement – and you get an opportunity to call someone like John Garrick at their house, uh, you take it however you can get it. The only way I could get it was a phone call. So I recorded a phone call, and that, that's, the, that's what you get. And it's the real deal. And this is the interview with uh, John Garrick about a fly rod of your own, available now on Simon & Schuster, everywhere good books are sold. That was almost a commercial. <laughs> All right, here it is. <laughs> Hey, John, welcome to the Fish Nerd. Uh, I'm so excited to talk to you because you're, you're like fly fishing royalty. And uh, congratulations on the new book, A Fly Rod of Your Own. Um, and I just finished it this morning at like 5 in the morning. I read it. <laughs> Well, good, good. It's uh, I'm glad you did. It's uh, You know, you get interviewed by people who didn't read the book but read the press release. I read that too. <laughs> <laughs> But, no, I, I read the book, and, and a bunch of our fans have read the book also. Um, but I, one of our fans actually sent a question. His name is Jeff Danielson, and he said, the first sentence in your book, uh, the goal of fly fishing isn't just to catch fish, but to catch them with style. That's an excellent description. He remembers when he was a kid uh, seeing some guys fishing for bluegills with fly rods, and he was struck by the elegance of a well-executed cast. Um, what got you into fly fishing? Well, it was just that. It was exactly that. I had fished more or less all my life. Um, a few years ago at a family reunion, we found, we were going through an old photo album, and we found a picture of me, you know, at about three feet high, barefoot, shirtless, holding a cane pole and what looks like a tiny little uh, bullhead. Mm-hmm. And we figured that was probably the first physical evidence of me fishing, and I would have been five. But um, it wasn't really until I moved out to Colorado after college and I saw people fly fishing. And I just thought, that is just the prettiest damn thing I've ever seen. It really is pretty. 
I'd never seen it before. People didn't, in those days, it was really rare in the Midwest where I grew up. Where did you grow up? Uh, well, I was born in a little town called Glenwood, Illinois. Dad worked for Sears by then. And um, he, we moved from there to Minnesota, where, uh, which was wonderful. Wonderful place to be when you're, you know, just growing up and you're a fisherman. We lived across from the lake. I had a canoe. It was, it was, you know, it was like heaven. And then for my last two years in uh, high school, we were in uh, northern Ohio, which was pretty much of a shithole at the time. <laughs> that, was, that was back. I was there, in fact, when the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Oh, my God. And, I mean, so, you know, fishing wasn't really... Uh, an attractive possibility. It, you 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 weren't supposed to eat anything you caught out of Lake Erie because it'd kill you. <laughs> but when I came west, it was just I I just thought it was beautiful. I I'd, I'd never caught a trout in my life. Um, I thought trout were prettier than you know the bass and stuff I'd caught as a kid, and it was just that. It was just a purely aesthetic thing. It's like catching pieces of art, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, so so I'm I'm a brand new fly fisher. I'm actually uh-huh. a fish, I'm a fishing guide in New Hampshire, but I don't fly fish. I, I haven't been been a fly fisher. I mean, ice fishing has been my uh, my my obsession. Uh, so so this spring I decided to become a fly fisher. In fact, this morning I went fishing and I haven't caught anything. <laughs> <laughs> Anything yet than picking up the fly rod. I mean, years ago I fly fished a little bit, I dabbled, um, and I've been some car fishing a lot. Um, but, but reading your book really kind of motivated me to like, I gotta get dig in deeper um, on this on this fly fishing in this fly fishing world. Um, so what, what I really liked about your book um, was was the how much of North America you cover in this one volume. Uh, you know, I live, I, I saw you went to Alaska, you've been in Canada, of course, all over Colorado, but you've been to New Hampshire. You fished the Androscoggin River. I did. I did, I yeah. I, I live half an hour from there. Yeah, it's a beautiful river. It's an amazing fishery, and it's, and it's not appreciated as one of the big fisheries either, which is really neat. Um, I, think, I think it's neat. I mean, I argue with people about that. There was... Um, I'll try to make this quick. There's a river out here, actually not a river, kind of a creek, and it was, um, you know, the uh, it was polluted. It was polluted with old mine tailings, and the uh, EPA, <clears throat> excuse me, the EPA came in very quietly and just cleaned it up, and fish started to work down from upstream, and it started to be populated with fish, and nobody knew about it. Okay. And, uh, and, yeah, and this guy from TU said, called me up and he said, well, we got to promote this. And I said, no, 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 dude. <laughs> Get your mouth shut. <laughs> they think they want to promote it. How many secret spots are there left, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Uh, a, a river that isn't, you know, fished much, and that's good. Uh, I don't know why you're even talking about it on a podcast, frankly. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, it's funny because my goal is, is I want to get more people fishing. We're losing in New Hampshire about 3% of anglers a year. There's like 3% less fishing license mm-hmm. sales going on every single year. And so one of my goals is to get more people on the water. Uh, yeah. And, and so I'm one of those other I'm, – I'm the opposite of you in the brain of I want I want people out there. And if someone calls me up and says, hey, we're going to catch a trout today, I'm going to point at a spot and say, go get one right there. I have my own yeah. too. But, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'll tell yeah, people I get it. on the fish. Well, the, the only reason I can be secretive and fishing still survives is that other people aren't, you know. Right. Well, you have guides. <laughs> so they, um, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Which which helps you a lot, but that the guide chapter in the book um, slayed me because reading that was like, you know, just it's like reading into my own brain sometimes. I really, I, I really liked your joke when you uh, you said what's the difference between a uh, fishing guide and a large pizza. That was my, 
I, before I read the punchline, I knew the answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, well, a, a large pizza can feed a family, and and that's a guide joke. I mean, that's a guide, a, a joke guides tell each other. <laughs> I never heard it before that. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. But I'm new at um, it, and that's so I don't hang out with other guides yet. Yeah, it's you know I guided a little bit early on, just to pick up some extra money, and I did just enough to realize that I don't have it to be a guide. I don't. I don't have the patience. I don't have the the generous nature to really want this Nimrod to catch a fish. You know what I mean? I, I just didn't have it. And um, but I'm, I've always been fascinated by guides, and the better they are, the more fascinated I am. There's some amazing guides around. There are now. Yeah, it's. Um, and it's an interesting thing. There was a time, and you can still find this up in the northeastern part of Canada, where the guide assumes it's his job to take you where the fish are and then stand there leaning on a net and not say much. Oh. Um, as, as one guy said to me, his name was Howard, up in Labrador, he said, well, you know, I figure if a guy came all this way to fish and he doesn't know how to fish, that's just tough shit, eh? Oh, God. <laughs> and but now it's like a guide has to be a counselor and a teacher and you name it, you know. There's a lot of hand holding for sure. But it's funny you see that attitude with deep sea guides. I've been on some deep sea trips where that's what they do. They just park the boat and they fish and it's, it's well, the same thing. It's tough shit. <laughs> the little the little bit of saltwater fishing I've done has been like that. Yeah, where the guy just he might give you a fly. He might say fish this. And stand up there, and if I see a fish, I'll let you know. And then he's, you know, he's talking to his broker on the cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a broker. That's cool. Um, uh, Jeff uh, Johnson, one of our listeners, again, he called in, and uh, he said he really enjoyed your description uh, of your high regard of the venerable uh, de Havilland Beaver float plane and the bush pilots who fly them. He thinks mm -hmm. the kit to uh, the old Willie's Jeep, also mentioned in the book. Um, newer isn't always better. A lot of anglers are going retro these days, going back to fiberglass rods and Martin reels. What do you think of this? Is it a fad, or is it an appreciation uh, that everything doesn't have to be super high performance? Um, well, it probably is a fad, but who, who knows what's a fad and what's a trend? I mean, if I knew that, I'd be rich, right? True. <laughs> um, I think it is kind of an appreciation of simplicity. Um, I like like most fishermen. I have most fly fishermen anyway. Yeah, I've been doing this for better part of half a century now, and I, you know, my first impulse was to buy everything, and the the tackle industry was happy to provide it. Sure, you know, all kinds of goo guys and special stuff and, and, you know, a different rod with a different line for every fish. And and it, it just, I'm not sure that worked. Um, some specialized stuff, if you're fishing for steelhead on a great big river, there's nothing like a spay rod with a skagit head on it. Um, but for the most part, um, gosh, you know, if you've got a five or six weight rod, and a floating line, you can probably do 80 or 90 percent of the fishing most of us will ever do with that. Well, then I have the right thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you do. Right. Well, that's that's good news. Um, so, so New Hampshire's made a big move in the last couple of years to like tighten up our regulations, and, and we're not using lead anymore. Mm -hmm. um, take the bird, which is super good. A lot of the country's not doing that yet. Um, except in the fly fishing industry. The, the fly fishers are exempt from the no lead laws. Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I think maybe it's probably okay because of the tiny little amounts of lead that you end up losing, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, um, I, don't... <laughs> I use I use non toxic weight when I use weight. Just on general principles. I mean, so many of the things we we're supposed to do 
in the interests of conservation. They just seem like the tiniest little things that couldn't make any difference. But you have to think, well, if tens or hundreds of thousands of people do them, then it will make a difference. And that. And so, I don't know, if if you're going to, I think probably if you're going to ban uh, lead for fishing, you should ban it for everybody. There are, there are good non-toxic um, weight systems that you can use. Yeah, and they come out with more and more great stuff. Now, by the way, that question came from a listener also. Um, and another one that came in was about Tenkara. You wrote about Tenkara in, um, I think it's All Fishermen Are Liars. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you, is Tenkara fly fishing? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in, New, in New Hampshire, it has not it's been called not fly fishing. You can't fly fish with Tenkara in a fly fishing only body of water. Really? Yeah. And that's because the New Hampshire Guides Association, all the fly guides got together and made a big stink about it. Yeah. And well, then, it sounds, that sounds more political than practical. I mean, <laughs> You know, you're you got a fly on the end of a leader, so why wouldn't it be fly fishing? Yeah, so they made the legislation define fly fishing as the the fly, the leader, the rod, and the reel. So with no reel, no fly fishing. Yeah, yeah, which is silliness. But that's just New Hampshire's funny. I mean, I think every state has funny fishing laws and and rules. And and how do you navigate that with all your travel? How do you figure out what you're supposed to do wherever you're going. Well, you find out. I mean, you know, there's there's always an agency in charge, and they're always happy enough to tell you. And um, you you obey the law. Jeez, especially when you're, if you're a writer, you know, you're out of state, you're a writer. Uh, too many people would have too much fun if I got <laughs> busted for poaching or whatever. Have you uh, ever or got busted? Have you ever broken the law and got in trouble? Yeah, but, you know, it was so long ago, I like to think the statute of limitations <laughs> ran out on that. My, my Uncle Leonard was, um, you know, he was one of those charming guys who kind of operated on the dark side. I mean, we, we snuck through a lot. When I was a little kid, we snuck through a lot of fences with no trespassing signs on them and caught fish and took them home and ate them and... Um, it was just, you know, I just, I just figure it was a long time ago. I didn't know any better, but I, you know, I've since come around. I mean, and I mean, a long time ago, where if you want to, I don't know, I was never really an anarchist. I just felt if you didn't like the law, you should try to change it, but you, you, you don't really get away with breaking it. No, that's how I feel. I mean, I've, I've on accident done things, but generally speaking, I try to stay within them. So. But, you know, most of the places I go, if you're fishing with a single barbless fly, I mean, if you can fish at all, you're probably legal. Yeah, it seems likely, especially if you're catching and releasing, so where the seasons don't matter as much and you have all that. Um, so speaking of catch and release, really, really, you, you went Arctic char fishing and you ate Arctic char. Do you get any blowback from the hardcore fly fisher catch and release guys about eating the char? No. No? Okay. No, no. <laughs> I've, you know, I've, I've written a number of times about eating fish, and um, I don't remember ever having any, hearing any criticism about it. And, you know, as you know, people are happy enough to criticize now. I mean. They love it. But it's all anybody does online. They love it. Um, I think people get it. It's uh, and you know my my defense, if I needed one, is that it it's legal. That's a good. Defense. It's always I'm always someplace where it's legal to keep a fish, and um, so sometimes we do. I, I think it's good. I'm, I support you in that. <laughs> I I um. Two years ago, I went on a quest to catch and eat every kind of freshwater fish in the state of New Hampshire. Yeah, I heard about that. What was it, 48 species? 48. Yeah, you heard about that. That's cool. Um, yeah, 48. We got them all, and we got some blowback from catching these guys, especially when we got into the trout. And uh, 
and mugs and basically I know most of those traps were introduced species and <laughs> borderline invasive anyway, but it was totally fine. Uh -huh. Um, but it, 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 we, we brought attention to all kinds of fish no one's ever heard of. Do you ever, do you still, as, your, as a regular fisher, do you branch out of the trout world and go into other fish still, or do you just really focus on trout? Oh, no, I've, I've, I will basically fish for anything. Um, in fact, I'm talking uh, with Bob White right now about meeting him out in South Dakota and fishing his uh, secret mega uh, carp lake. Oh, are you going to fly fish for carp? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's great fun. It's like, bone, it's like fishing for bonefish. Oh, that sounds it's, like so much fun. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's, it's uh, you know, if, if you're a freshwater guy, it's kind of your one chance to catch a 10-pound fish on a fly that's going to take you into the backing. Oh, man. <laughs> it's so cool. But, I I will say I'm I'm a trout salmon and steelhead guy predominantly. Um, I would I could happily fish for salmonids for the rest of my life and not bat an eye. But you know I've fished a lot for bass. I, I like panfish. Um, uh, you know I like grayling. Um, I like Arctic char. I actually like Arctic char a lot. They're a really cool fish. They, I've never seen one in real life. They have them up in Maine, about eight hours north of where I am right now. That's the closest Arctic char. And someday I'm going to make a drive up and and try and catch one. You should. They're a really cool fish. They're, um, you know, very close to brook trout. Right, brook very trout, close to being lake trout, trout are all similar, yeah. And, and they yeah. apparently taste good, right? <clears throat> oh, God, yeah. They're they're one of the best eating fish, I think. And I have um, I fished with a guy in the Northwest Territories, who was, he's actually, I think he quit guiding, he is now, and he was studying to get his doctorate in fisheries biology with a specialty in char. And, you know, in taxonomy, there's lumpers and there's splitters. There's people where, you know, every lake has a different species, and then there's people who think, no, no, it's all just one species. Mm -hmm. Well, he was, a, he was a lumper, and his he said, uh, Dolly Varden's, Arctic char, brook trout, and lake trout were all the same species. Wow. And, you know, I don't care one way or another. Right. They, they, they look different, they act different, so I figure they're different. But, uh, sure. you know, the science of it doesn't, uh, I'm not going to argue with it. Well, I mean, they're all char, but they're different species. I mean, yeah. 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 Yeah, there's a lot of people, and then, you know, people are so bad at naming fish anyway, so wherever you go, the fish's local names will wreck you all day long and try to figure out actually trying to catch. Well, hey, um, I'm, we're about out of time, but so so you've been writing for a long time. You've got dozens of books out, and, and I'm, I'm very curious because I'm always, I'm always impressed by people who can make a living in the fishing world, especially in the, um, you know, in the writing world of fishing, which is amazing to me that you're – you're doing that. Um, what's your you have any big piece of advice you can give to someone who's trying to make their way into that into that world? Like if someone's a new writer and they're trying to get recognized and seen, what would you tell that person? Well, you know, it's kind of difficult because I started so long ago that I could go into great detail about how I got started, but it isn't like that anymore. You know what I mean? There's, there's sure. I, there was, we worked on typewriters and through the mail, and there were lots of print outlets and little magazines and little regional magazines, and you could kind of make a living, piece of living together. Now it's mostly Internet, and um, I don't know how people make a living on the Internet. I really don't. I can't figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I've, well, I've, I've sure. known a couple of people who tried and failed. Yeah. Uh, I've never tried, but I think the best piece of advice is to forget about being a fisherman and think of yourself as a writer. Learn how to write. That matters. And, and just, I mean, think of yourself not as a fishing writer, but as a writer who just happens to be writing about fishing at the moment. Concentrate much more on the writing than on the fishing. And that's, that seems solid advice. And reading your work, especially this book, and this is the first one of your books I've read, 
um, is, is I found the description of the locations of what the rivers look like and what the trees look like. You can feel like you're going to be there. So it's clear that the writing is is the focus of the book, and the fish have to be a topic. So I think it's that you nailed it. Yeah, well, Nick Lyons once said the best fishing stories aren't really about fishing anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably true. They're they're about something else. A lot of times they're just a lot of times. I mean, I'm people think I'm a fishing writer, and I guess I am. But I most of this is would pass as travel writing. Oh, that's what I was thinking. A lot of the book, I mean, there's some chapters of no fishing at all in here. They're just telling mm -hmm. stories about people and places. Oh yeah. But hey, great, great book. I really enjoyed it. And now I have to go back and read your catalog. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm hooked in. You've, you've set the hook here. So and that's um, so the book is a fly rod of your own, and it just came out um, what, last month on Simon Schuster, right? Yep, early last month. Early, and we're giving a few copies away on the show too. So we'll do that. So hey, John, thank you for your time, uh, and I'll be I'll be following your adventures. Okay, thank you. Okay, wow. So I did it. I interviewed someone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, you I was nervous. You interviewed someone famous. <laughs> I know. Yes. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, he's only ever done one other podcast. Well, we're an elite crowd. Yeah. Do you know the podcast? Uh, I don't know what no, other podcast he did. It's the Tenkara podcast. Ah. Uh, um, in fact, um, that, that Tenkara company, Tenkara was mentioned in one of his previous books. I think it was All Fishermen Are Liars. Correct. Oh, yeah, Tenkara USA, probably. Yeah, Tenkara USA. They have a podcast, and, and they got yes, to Daniel. John. Yeah. Yeah, that's Daniel Gallard, Gallardo's He's got a great podcast. accent, doesn't he? Yes, it's, yeah. he's Brazilian. I thought he was from, like, like a, like Slovenia or something. I had no idea. I, I'm so bad at accents, I don't know stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very, um, yeah, it, it's toned way down. But, yes, he's Brazilian. Yeah, but it's actually a really good podcast, and they interview a lot of really cool people, and they got to have John Garrick on. So I listened to that, and then, of course, you know, I had to do my own thing. So um, so it, it, it was a good interview, but uh, let's talk about the book a little bit because people heard the interview. Um, what did, where do you want to start? Because this is your club. Well, my club, well. Mm -hmm. I, is... I'll, I'll admit I did read the whole book this time, too. Good job. Yeah, I read it in one sitting. I literally sat down and read it from beginning to end in just a couple of hours. Um, and, you know, it's it's not a – it's a collection of essays. Mm -hmm. um, and Yeah, there's no story arc. In fact, you there's, could – there's, there's no story arc at all. You could put this in the back of your toilet and read random chapters and it wouldn't make any difference. Yeah, and that's the way all of his books are. They're, they're just – um, you know, he says in there that if he were to classify himself, he would say he's more of a travel writer mm -hmm. uh, that just so happens to travel because he's fishing. Mm -hmm. um, and you can like a lot of travel writers. I you know they write the either. There's two genres of that. One is a book about this place or just essays about my travels. And, you know, the book is it's great. It's about fishing. But it's really about life. You know, he talks about stuff as wide ranging as wanting to buy a Jeep, <laughs> you know, um, why? So he can go fishing. Um, he has a, I would say, something of a love affair with the de Havilland Beaver float plane, um, which uh, is the kind of the workhorse plane that gets you to remote places in the wilderness so you can fish. And uh, he definitely waxes on about about those and about the bush pilots who seem to be a pretty interesting uh, group of people too. Well, it's, it's funny. And I think what's really, what's important to think, especially the bush pilots and the chapter about fishing guides is it isn't about the fish. It's about no. the people and places, you know, yeah. um, the, the two chapters I connected most with were like almost the last two in the book. Um, the fishing guide chapter I really liked and the Arctic char chapter. I want to talk a little bit about that in a little bit, but, um, the opening chapter I really liked to the opening in the op and I gave my book away already to a listener, so I don't have it. <laughs> um, but uh, in the opening, uh, one of my favorite lines was he, he's really great on these like kind of quick quick one liners. Is he says, um, "Yeah, he says uh, pockets abhor a uh, a vacuum." So right. So 
your, your fly fishing vest inherently is going to fill with flies. Every empty pocket will be full of flies. Really like that kind of style of writing. Yeah, yeah. He has a lot of uh, great witticisms. There's one, and I don't know exactly what book it's from, but he says that if some occasionally people don't walk away from you shaking their heads, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> well, you know, um, which I, I think that is the fish nerd uh, mantra because you know fish nerds would go fish for minnows mm-hmm. to eat them you know and people are going to walk away shaking their heads as why would you do this he understands why you would do that yeah and i'll tell you just talking to him what i liked best about him uh as a human being as a fly fisher is he wasn't a fly fishing snob no and i didn't no. get in reading his Far book i it. didn't get the feel from that and i've read other fly fishing books and i got bored of the attitude of fly fishermen Right, and yeah. And in his, I didn't feel that at all. I felt he's like an every guy fisherman who happens to like fly fishing the best. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I believe he grew up just, you know, soaking worms like the rest of us and mm-hmm. saw somebody fly fishing and said, wow, that looks cool. Well, it was about kind of art, in love with beauty, it. and it's pretty to look at. Yes, it's mm-hmm. pretty to look at. That's <laughs> kind of the same way. That's the same way it got me. I saw people casting flies, and I went, "That looks cool. Mm-hmm. I want to do that." And uh, found an old, junky old fly rod in our family boathouse, and you know, started messing around with it. And now it's probably forty years later, and I still do it. Yeah. Well, and and so, uh, what was your favorite? What's kind of good favorite? What favorite chapter in the book? Favorite segment? Well, I liked that last chapter about the char, but I also liked the section about the um, food and how the food, camp food, um, about how I relate to this a lot because I'm a Boy Scout leader and I spend a lot of time outside and sometimes in awful, terrible conditions and a good meal can just turn the worst of everything into great and it doesn't have to be gourmet somebody hand you a nice hot grilled cheese sandwich and a cup of Campbell's tomato soup and uh on a cold and rainy day that's that's just heaven it's gold and, yep yeah so that chapter really really spoke to me about the about the food because um you know recently i went on a trip um i think i talked about this before when i went with the tinkara bum and and we decided to do shore lunch and just, you know, we caught two fish and just took them right out of the river, threw them on a barbecue grill, cooked them, had them for lunch. And and there's just something really satisfying about that, you know, just right there, right by the side of the river. Here's your fish. Lunch. Yeah, and it's, it's magical. And I, and I find, like, as an ice fishing guide, I'm bringing people ice fishing, out fishing in the worst conditions. Yes. There's no – well, I, I think spring in the rain is worse than ice, but – but it's, it's arguably the coldest you're ever going to be is ice fishing. I can attest to that. I've done it. And But someone hands you a bratwurst that's hot and steaming with some um, sauerkraut on top and some mustard. They're handing you a handful of joy, right? They are. Uh, pure, they are. pure pleasure. And it's that same thing. It's that, and we all relate to that. We've all been that hungry where that you get that sense of relief of eating. So uh, it's a yeah. really connective idea. Yeah, and he had a. He talks about that, you know, when he started out and he'd go out backpacking or, you know, overnight back into the woods to fish, and he would take along this certain brand of beef stew, which I'm almost certain I know what it is. I think Denty Moore. It would be Denty Moore, the yeah. bright orange concoction that is supposed to be beef stew. Oh, I've eaten a lot of that in my Boy Scouting days, especially I when I was. Well, we used, oh, to, we used to peel the top off the can, put the can right in the heat. Set it right in the fire. Yeah. Yep. And eat it right out of the can. Yep. Yep. And and even that on a cold winter day is just magic, even though if you ate that at home, you'd probably be like, why in the world am I eating this? Well, I mean, we've all done that, too. We've all tried to replicate meals in the field at home. And it yes. doesn't translate. Nope. It, I, nope. One of the best cheeseburgers I ever had in my life, I cooked on a cast iron skillet on an open fire during a like a monsoon almost. Yeah. And yeah, I, the bit. Yeah. Unbelievably good. I've kind of come home and tried to do the same thing. Cast iron skillet that's almost red hot. I even dumped r- water like out of a spigot onto the onto the cast iron skillet while I was cooking and trying to get that replication, but it didn't work. 
Yeah. Because yeah, I think fit, you need a physio physiological change in your body. You need to be in distress for that to be good. Yes. One of the, <laughs> the best steak I've ever had in my life was cooked directly over a campfire on a mm -hmm. metal grate while mm -hmm. I was deer hunting. And it was cold and it was, you know, and just yank that steak right off the fire and dig into it. And best steak I ever had in my entire life. I will never have a better steak. I am convinced of it. It's remarkable. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead cause I really want to talk about Arctic char and we don't have a lot of time. Um, so, so in the, in the chapter of Arctic char, I'm going to do some spoiling here a little bit because I want to talk about a few techniques in the chapters. Now, this is the only chapter in the book where, where he actually talks about going purposefully after fish with the intent of eating them. Is, is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And, and I love that because, because it's important uh, as outdoorsmen or outdoors people that, that that's a real thing that people eat, eat animals. Um, we don't just catch them and take their photos and let them go. Um, right. But my favorite was, you know, he's fishing in a place where you can't cast with your fly far enough to get an Arctic char. And do you recall yeah, the, the technique? Yeah, the river's too big. Yeah. So yeah, the guy would cast out with a big spoon and, and try to pull one out, uh, pull one into fly range by having it chase the spoon, and then he'd cast out and and uh, catch the char. Right, which I think is great technique, right? So like every fly fisherman needs to be friends with a guy with a spinning rod. That's, That's my right. takeaway. That's like we, we're, we're in the same family. We just fish a little different. But uh, yeah. I love that idea of like, all right, taste the spoon and then catch on the fly. You know, and, and now my brain just says, why don't you just get a nine and a half foot spit, ultralight spinning rod? <laughs> just catch it on right. the spoon because you'd have that same fight, you know, but maybe you wouldn't. I don't know because I haven't caught a big fish on a fly. So I don't get it yet. I'm, I'm going to learn this. Yeah, I would tell you that your, your first big fish that you could probably catch on a fly would be a bass. I have, caught, I have caught bass on the fly in the past. I sight fish for Yeah, them. and then carp. And I believe Ooh. he mentioned that in the in the interview. Yeah. Actually, they're they're tricky. I would say that you'll come sooner catching a trout or a salmon than you will a carp. They are spooky. They are uh, difficult to pursue. But uh, when you when you hook into one, and I've done it with a fly rod. Hold on, because mm -hmm. they are going to take off, and you're you're going to get that screaming reel. You're going to maybe see your backing, which you are hardly ever going to see that with a trout. And let me tell you, they're they're an outstanding uh, fly rod game fish, and they're everywhere. Yeah, and they're well, they're an outstanding game fish, and they're under yes, under period. hunted. I mean, people really aren't catching them everywhere. You know, in New Hampshire, we've got a pretty strong carp population in a couple of rivers, and there's very few people fishing for them for them very few yeah and it's my grandfather was a great uh lover of catching carp uh, he liked to eat them sure and yeah yeah so but, but who wouldn't want to catch a 15 pound fish yeah you know all these big game fishermen who are after like the giant bass snub their nose at carp fishing meanwhile oh, a, a that, carp will put a bass to shame in in the sure. fight category <laughs> i they think really in the will. short in the short sprint of a fight but they give up yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, carp have the ability to recover um, kind of their oxygen levels in their bloodstream faster than a lot of other fish. Mm -hmm. And so they can put up a pretty sustained fight, whereas a lot of times a bass, a bass has a fast burst, and then usually they give up after, oh, I don't know, you know, a minute or two. A carp can really... Take you, take you to town. That's true. Uh, now, if you were a, a fish and you got your own so – imagine if you can be a fish with your own personality right now. Okay. And you got hooked. How would you react? Would you be a fighter or would you just quit? Uh, my personality would be just like, uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, it's this. Shit. <laughs> oh, man, really? It's over. Oh, it's my day to go. Either that or I, uh, I, I often envision the fish of, especially the ones we release, of going back and say, hey, I was like abducted. Uh, these beings abducted me. They took me out of out of my environment. They did strange things to me, and then they put me back, and then the other fish are like, yeah, right. Yeah, I believe yeah, that. You expect me to believe that. What about yeah, this big whatever. hole in my lip? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You're just you're making things up. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the trout I caught today and released, he 
it was in really crystal clear water and he just went right down and put his face under a rock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and other ones will take off and jump and jump and jump and mm -hmm. you just never really know what, what's going to happen. And we don't know who lives, you know? Yeah. That's the, the thing we'll never know for sure. Cause a fish can swim away and look like they're recovering and then 10 minutes later just die. So yeah. it's really difficult. Uh, the other chapter I liked a lot, um, was the, the, the guiding chapter, hanging out with fishing guides. I'm sure you did because now that you're in the guiding world, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that that resonated with you quite a bit. Sure. Although I don't understand the guiding world yet. Um, I still don't know if I quite fit in <laughs> with the guiding world. <laughs> Being a nerd and never been, have never been a, a sports person or a jock of any kind, I always feel like those niche kind of clubs, I always feel a little out of place. You know, like I'm not quite as macho. I'm not quite as tough of those guy as those guys are. Yeah. But my, my favorite joke was, was his I think I talked to it with the interview. I mentioned it to him too. It was, um, the was there a difference between a guide and a large pizza? And I love that joke. <laughs> Right. Yeah. That the a large pizza can fa feed a family. That's perfect. Yeah. That really yep. kind of ideal. And it, and I didn't realize going into it how how much money I I wouldn't uh, make guiding. Correct. <laughs> and how many trips yeah. I give away. Right. Yeah. Well, it's all about building your business. I think once you finally establish yourself um, as a guide, you'll start making money. But it's definitely not something that you're just gonna put out your shingle and the next day you're. You're making big money. No, absolutely not. But anyway, it's pretty cool. And and so w give me one more highlight of the book for you. Like, give me one more thing you thought, a big takeaway you got. Well, I, you know, that very first chapter where he talks about, um, you know, the, the goal, and you're, you're discovering this maybe, that the goal of fly fishing isn't just to catch fish. Nope. But nope, I am not. I, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I don't even. It, it's complete bogus, complete bullshit. Not a thing. I don't understand it one bit. It's pretend. Well, it's not yeah. A thing. I think yeah. To me, the you know, fly fishers <laughs> are sort of a of a perverse bunch in mm -hmm. that there are easier ways to catch fish. Um, you know, and I fish all different ways. I you know, I fly rod. I use tenkara tackle a lot probably more so now than conventional fly tackle. I uh, spin fish, bait caster fish, you name it, you know, soak stink bait for catfish. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter. <clears throat> I just like fishing. But I think there's just something about fly fishing that has an appeal. Um, you know, it, it's a, whenever you catch something on a fly rod, you just feel a slightly little bit more, like you've accomplished something. Like you're better than other people. Well, I wouldn't say that because <laughs> I I get tired. Oh, I get so tired of fly snobbery because there's intra fly snobbery um, where people will always want to tell you that you're fly fishing the wrong way. Oh, and your fly is not a real fly. It's a yeah, that's not a fly. That's yeah. not a fly. I'm like, is it? Yeah. Okay. Whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's just kind of a self imposed um, challenge. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't. I. I get all over people about this all the time in other Facebook groups about, you know, they'll start trash talking people who you spin fish. And I'll be like, look, just because you, you can trick an animal with a brain the size of a pea, that does not make you an aqua wizard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're no better than anybody else. Um, you know, everybody has their own way of enjoying fishing. Um, I happen to really enjoy fly fishing and, you know, if if given my choices, that's that's what I'm going to do. Well, uh, well, we're, but, I'm going to get there. I'm gonna, I, once I catch I'm catching trout, I will get there. I'm bass fishing tomorrow with a fly rod, so I, I'll have some success tomorrow for sure. Yeah, you got to go find somewhere where they dumped in a bunch of stockies that are dumb and <laughs> and will bite anything that hits the water. And then yeah. you'll be like, yes, this is great. Yeah. Um, we'll yeah. <laughs> we'll or, or you or you just manage to get in them when they're on something that's. You know, like uh, you get a big hatch or something mm -hmm. and you've got that fly, you know, and I'll tell you what that fly is. If there's a hatch, you can't go wrong with, with the uh, parachute atoms. That's the uh, works for just about everything. And uh, if they're eating stuff off the surface and it's big enough, you can see it. Throw on a parachute atoms and you'll probably catch a fish. Well, that's that's super good advice. Um, but hey, back to the book. Now, that doesn't list. count for the contest. No, it doesn't count that that no, you can't reuse Jeff's advice. Yeah. Um, your advice, by the way, for the contest, again, we're giving away a copy of John Garrick's book. Um, 
a fly rod of your own, uh, it doesn't have to be good fly fishing advice. Just give us some piece of advice. Advice, that's all. 607-378-FISH. And again, that, that book is A Fly Rod of Your Own by John Gehrig. Uh, and we enjoyed it. And we thank Simon Schuster for sending us some copies to, to read him. We, we gladly read more books that are sent to us. Um, and I didn't, I didn't prep you up with this, Jeff, but do you have a book picked out for our I June? Don't. No? Okay. And well, I would stay like tuned. somebody yeah. to suggest. I, you know, yeah. I, can, I can pick all I want, but that's just what Jeff wants to read. I want to know what the listeners would like to read. So, ah, good idea. Well, you tell you what. Get um, some Facebook suggestions. We'll um, put it out there. And, yeah. All right. Then I'll tell you what. Next week on the show, I'll, we'll pick, a, pick a, a book and I'll announce it on next week's show. Excellent. Also coming up next week, I am participating in a citizen science experiment. And very exciting. Yeah, this is called Eating with the Ecosystem. It's actually a nonprofit at Rhode Island. And their their goal is at Eating with the Ecosystem, their mission is to promote a place-based approach to sustaining New England's wild seafood through healthy habits, flourishing food web, and short adaptive supply chains. And the basic concept is they want everyone who eats seafood to eat like a fish would eat, which means you don't eat just one thing. You eat what's nearby, you eat what's in season, and you eat what's plentiful, right? So, right. And so what they're doing is they've gathered, I think, 100 people together all over New England, and every single Monday they give us a list of four fish we need to find at our local fish market, whether it's supermarket or a local fishmonger. We have to buy it. And there are four fish that are in season, locally caught, and um, and plentiful. So not they're not going to be giving us a lot of uh, a lot of endangered species, right? Right. Um, and we have to go and get the fish, cook them, and then report back on this whole we have a whole data collection thing. And not finding the fish is as good a data as finding the fish because it helps them when they start marketing this concept to the public of how to properly eat seafood. They'll know that, for example. Super chain, supermarket chain, whatever, doesn't carry sustainable seafood. Right. And then they can make a big deal about it. And then that big supermarket can go, oh, yeah, we're trendy. We can do that. We have gluten-free and sustainable seafood. So they know the whole thing's important. Because <laughs> right now, more people are gluten-free than are sustainably eating. And oh, that's, yeah. And it's just stupid because gluten-free is not a real thing. But Yeah. yeah anyway, that's a whole other conversation. And if you don't disagree with me on that, you are wrong. <laughs> because only white, rich Americans are gluten-free. That's it. Right. <laughs> if you're a poor person, guess what? Not gluten-free. Please bring the gluten. That's right. Bring it on. But anyway, it's a, it's a yeah. <laughs> another conversation, another time. Um, but anyway, eating with the ecosystem is really cool. And my fish this week, which I, by the way, was not able to find locally here in the White Mountains, was uh, were sea urchin, razor clams, whiting, uh, spiny or, and spiny dogfish or Cape shark, depending on how you market it. None of those are available in the Mount Washington Valley. So my reporting was very short this week, but next week I'll report on every week. I'm going re- I'm to be cooking something new and I'll be reporting back every single week on what I'm finding. And if it's interesting, it'll be a longer conversation, but because this week it's not, it's over. Well, I can tell you about two of the three of those things sure. or two of the, two of the five of I've had sea urchin before. Yep. Uh, is that unagi? No, no. Um, I can't remember. Unagi is the freshwater eel. No, um, it, yeah, right. You're right. Yeah. The sea urchin is the essentially the row mm-hmm. from out of the middle of it. It's orange. It's kind of pasty. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of an acquired taste. Um, I like it. Yeah. I had it with sushi. It's quite good. Yeah, I've had all four of these. Razor clam is amazing. Fabulous. And I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something that was available when I lived in the Pacific Northwest. Yep. I used to get them out in Washington State in CQ. Yes. Yep. Very, very good. Um, astoundingly good. Mm-hmm. And then whiting is a silver hake, which I've eaten, and dogfish I've also eaten. And most people, if you're in England, for example, and you've had uh, fish and chips, you've probably had spiny dogfish. So yeah, a, that is the go-to uh, mm-hmm. fish and chips fish now. Because it's super cheap. Uh, also, quick update. A week from today, I am going to be at the Virginia Aquarium for a week. I'm spending five days there recording live shows a whole week. I'm there uh, for their Sensible Seafood Festival presented by PNC Bank. Uh, and on a Thursday, May 25th, is the actual Sensible Seafood Festival, which is a whole sustainable seafood fest from 7 to 10 p.m. at the Virginia Aquarium. Tickets are like 65 bucks, and you get to eat 
tons of delicious seafood provided by local um, restaurants and chefs. And I've been to Virginia Beach, and I've been to the restaurants down there. The, the seafood is unfreaking believable. And um, one of the goals of the, of the festival this year is to go uh, trash free. So no single use plastic, no paper plates, no plastic forks, no plastic cups. So um, that's, that's so, admirable. Yeah, and so they're trying to get restaurants to think about: can we do edible plating, edible silverware, finger foods, uh, things like that? And uh, and I'm since I'm judging the fest, I get to decide who wins, which I'm excited about. Well, I can tell you, tortilla makes an excellent edible plate. It does, and they make edible plates out of out of banana leaves and like all kinds of stuff. So it's just all kinds of options. Um, I also would imagine just a nice big quahog shell makes a good plate. Yep. Yep. And totally biodegradable. So it'd be a really fun event. Look forward to like reporting live all week. I'm going to be at the aquarium for five days, man. They're putting me up in a fancy hotel and they're feeding me and I'm, I'm doing a couple presentations. I'm doing a big, long, uh, hour long presentation um, the first day I arrive, uh, which I'm super nervous about. Um, but I think I'm going to be okay. I, I'm good at talking. I got this. <laughs> me got talk, it. me talk good. But I'm excited about it. If you're in the Virginia Beach area, um, especially on the day of the event, come on down and look for me. If you see me, I'll give you some decals and I'll interview you for the show. But I'll be recording live shows all week in the aquarium. I get to hang out with all kinds of biologists and stuff. Uh, and I'm excited about that. And if there's things you want to know about what's happening in the, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, drop me a message and I will make sure I get the answer while I'm down there. So that's that. Hey, how about some fish in the news? I love fish in the news. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. Everyone loves fish in the news. And we're going to keep this short because we have a lot of show left ahead of us and we're going long. I actually want to talk about this really important story here, which you probably read. And this is from... Channel 8 News in Knoxville, Tennessee. The native fish in the large signature tank at Bass Pro in Stapleton got quite a stir when a teen decided to pull this stunt. Teens at other stores across the country... By the way, this stunt is a teenager jumping into the aquarium at the Bass Pro shop. Yeah, yeah, and who hasn't thought of it? Um, But we have the thing called impulse control. (laughs) Barely. (laughs) Because, <laughs> yeah, the big Bass Pro Shop here, not far from my house. And, yeah, it, you stand up above it, you look down in it, and you go, oh, man, I could do such a great cannonball down oh, into this. I, 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 every time I look at it, I think about jumping into it. So let's hear what people are saying. I mean, it's just stupid. Oh, yep, he nailed it. <laughs> just stupid. Customers like Doug Hammond don't think it's very funny. Well, I think it's uh, the wrong thing for him to do, you know, because of the ecosystem. Uh, by the way, there, there, I don't know if you can hear what the person just said. He said it's the wrong thing to do because it upsets the ecosystem. Are you, are you, do you think that's a problem? Um, well, as an aquarist or a former aquarist, you don't want to – you don't know what that person has, personal body care products and things like that. You may not want that into your uh, into your water system. Yeah, but they put pretty hardy fish in these things, and I'm sure they get. Yeah. A, I, I I'm interested. I, I I'd be interested in digging in a little deeper on this and finding out what the kill rate is at these aquariums. Like how many fish die every week or month at the average bass pro shops. Yeah, I don't know. I see the same fish every time I go back um, yeah, to I've, my local one. So I, you know, I have to imagine that. Some of them have been there for quite some time. I imagine they, I imagine it's either one or the other. Either they die fast or they make yep. it for a long time. Yeah, and yeah. they have some astoundingly large catfish at ours. Um, ah, just want to fish in it once. Yeah. Let's just test the lure out. All right, let's hear what the rest of the story is. The store brought in an animal care team to assess the fish's health. A spokesman says they're doing okay. And in a statement, he said, Our associates and security team quickly address the issue safely and without incident. Such occurrences are extremely rare and highly discouraged. I'm sad that it's so rare. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, uh, I, who hasn't thought it? Uh, especially most of them have a nice perching spot right up above. Um, and most Bass Pro Shops have the same same layout. I can't oh, say I, that I haven't stood up identical. there and went, hmm, boy, you could do a nice cannonball right oh, in there. It would be awesome. I, I would go up and smush my face against the glass. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Doc, then, Doc Martin did chime in on this conversation. Yes, uh, she did. She did. She chimed in with her, you know, being being herself. Uh, so she, here's what she says. I feel like a dumb ass, dumb b- ass, pun here somewhere, or like the bass, the person doesn't school. Uh, I guess he didn't see SEA, the sign. Uh, why'd he do it? Because he's all about dat yeah. bass, bass, dat bass, no trouble. Anyway, afterwards, he really smelt. So uh, thanks, Doc Martin, for writing all the jokes for this and never do yes. that again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was that was a pun run. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, she she accomplished it. Yeah. Doc Martin is truly a fish nerd. And <laughs> yes, I, 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 did you hear her song last week? I love the uh, 99 Problems song. That was great. Yeah. She's just the greatest. Um, I'm so happy she's part of this show. Um, speaking of which, Jeff, um, I'm actually looking to grow the show with more correspondence. We've got correspondents now in New Hampshire, of course, Massachusetts, uh, Australia, California. Um, South Carolina, right? And where are you? Uh, Missouri, Missouri, right at the Missouri-Kansas border. So we got you, and then in Kansas we have Doc Martin. And we're looking for more people. And if you're following along on our Facebook group right now, I put out an application for more people to join the show. I want more correspondence. And what I'm looking for specifically is people who can help diversify the show. I'm looking for aquarists. I'd even be looking for like animal rights activists. Um, people I disagree with, I welcome onto the show if they have a, a point of view that makes sense and, and fits the format. The only thing you can't be on the show is mean, unless you're Captain Sean, and then that's just your thing. Yeah. Um, that's his. He's the only one I'm letting on who's who's, who's such a grouch. Um, but we're looking for more voices. And if you want to be part of the show, and you think, man, you know, like, you know, Jeff Danielson was a fan for so long, and now he's part of the show. Um, you can be that. You can be part of the show as well. And so if you got ideas. Uh, head over to our Facebook group and find the application and fill it out. And eventually I'll get around to calling everybody on that list and interviewing you and seeing if you're a match. Um, you got to have two things. One, the ability to make a recording. And two, a voice worth recording. Um, that's it. <laughs> so, that's it. Yeah. So uh, because we do an audio show, you really it's really important to me that you know you can communicate. Um, and if, yeah, and I will say that I was inspired to jump in by uh, by the amazing James and uh, Fish Guy Josh. Yeah, who we haven't um, heard from in a long time, right? Yeah, they've been busy. Yeah, so we'll get them back. Um, but yeah, I mean, th- those guys were fans, and then they emailed me and said, "Clay, I, we love what you do. We want to do. We want to help you." And I'm like, "Yeah, come on." Um, yep. And that does two things. One, it makes my job every week of making a show easier, which is nice. But more importantly is it makes the show more interesting because we have more ideas, more thoughts, more voices. And The Fish Nerds is a variety show. It's, it's, it's And it belongs to the fans and it, it belongs to you guys. And I'd like to have more people contributing. And so check it out. I think you're going to like uh, being part of this group. And we have a... Um, we got a good bunch so far. This is this is not meant to get rid of anybody who we currently have. It's just meant to just grow the show. So, more voices is always a good thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I've said, definitely would love to have some Aquarius on here. I've been out of the hobby for a long time. It's just doesn't fit in with my current lifestyle. But uh, yeah, those people love fish. Yeah, and, and we stole the name of fish nerds from Aquarists. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but you know. They didn't buy the website. <laughs> That's right. So there's that. <laughs> All right, cool. Hey, how about uh, you want to do one more piece of news? Sure. All right. Let's do one more piece of news. And this is from thehustle.com. Jeff, how old are you? I am 49 years old. Do you remember the hustle? Do the hustle. Of course. All right. Fishy price scheme gets canned. Canned tuna giant Bumblebee Foods has agreed to pay the Justice Department $25 million for their plans to fix, raise, and maintain the price of packed seafood from 2011-2013. And it says, wait, you mean these generic cans of second-rate tuna are at the store? Yep. Those guys, apparently, in this $17 billion industry, it's sink or swim. Canned tuna is in troubled water. By the way, this is not the first time canned tuna has been in trouble, troubled water. And I think a year ago, I reported that uh, canned tuna, I think might have been even uh, bumblebee tuna, 
was being sued because they were misrepresenting the amount of tuna in each can. They were skimming. Ah. Now, now, if you recall, in this, you could, you could either apply to be part of the lawsuit or they would mail you some coupons to buy some tuna fish. And I, I, I put in for my name on that, and I never got my coupons. Oh. So I never got my free canned tuna. There's what a couple tuna salad sandwiches <laughs> that's right. missing in your life. Now I've got to spend a dollar. Uh, and by the way, um, the, the next question we're going to ask is tuna sustainable, right? Yeah, and that some of the some of the there are species I think that are sustainable, but the big ones like the bluefin and and those, yeah, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. And I don't know the whole story on those. Uh, maybe Andrew Lewin from Speak Up for Blue can address some of that coming in the future here for us. He's really good at that kind of stuff. But uh, I know that they're in trouble water. And speaking of canned tuna being in trouble water, due to concerns over mercury levels and nets killing dolphins, Americans' demand for tuna has been steadily declining, which is good. So with the whole industry hurting, Bumblebee decided it would be good Easy fishing for old Monopoly buddy to raise prices to make up for lost sales. We're not sure who to partner, who their partner was. Uh, the, the brief only mentions a co-conspirator, but a likely culprit is another member of the big three, Starkist or Chicken of the Sea, who along with Bumblebee control 75% of the canned tuna market. Uh, so anyway, they got busted. Exact figures weren't mentioned about how much, uh, how much they, they got away with. But we do know that in 2014 alone, Bumblebee's profit was $145 million, meaning a $25 million fine for jacking up the price for three years is really just a slap on the wrist. Uh, and by the way, coming forward, the cans of tuna will become smaller in size, but the price is not going to change. So that's, that's your uh, tuna news. Yeah. Tuna news. Tuna news. And there's no news like tuna news. And I haven't had canned tuna fish in a long time. Um, it's been a long time. Mm. I used to really, really like it. Yeah. Eat sardines instead. I do. I do eat sardines. And the question is, is, you know, that, that tuna, you mix it with mayonnaise and you make a sandwich. Are there other fish we can do that with? Well, I just take the sardines and mustard sauce and mash it all up and put it on a piece of bread and you got a sandwich right there. Yeah. But do you, but I like mayonnaise. Like, well, I suppose you could add some mayo and just wacky. make a, make a sardine salad sandwich. Yeah. But can we take like, um. Like dogfish, or you know, I don't know, some other kind of fish, and, and smoke it, and do the same with it. I would imagine so. All right. Well, um, I, I'd love to hear from listeners if they've experimented with, with tuna alternatives. Uh, tell us what you've done. I'm super curious, and I will try it. I'm in. I'm in. And you know what? Screw Bumblebee Tuna, unless they want to sponsor this show. In which case, I'll take their money. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we'll take their money. Yeah. Otherwise, that screw you, Bumblebee Tuna. We only like Starkist. <laughs> yeah, da down, or down with Big Tuna. Yeah. All right. So that's it. You've listened to a couple of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. We'd like to thank our family for supporting <laughs> us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all sorts of silly things that nerds do. If you'd like to support the fish nerds, you can go to patreon.com, search for the fish nerds, and help us crowdfund this podcast. Yeah, hey, special thanks to John Gierick and Simon Schuster for... Um, for sharing the, uh, the book, um, A Fly Rod of Your Own with us, and the fishy stories. And hey, Jeff, thank you so much for being part of this episode. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd, spawn early and often. And avoid free lunches with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. <laughs> <laughs>